everybody. This is our concluding session on um, the work of Eugene Borowitz, uh, specifically his volume, <coughs> which we've been working with up to this point, uh, Renewing the Covenant, Theology for, a, for the Postmodern Jew. Um, if everything functioned uh, according to plan, uh, we left off in uh, near the end, actually, of his discussion of uh, a post-liberal theology of Jewish duty. And um, what I simply wanted to reiterate from the concluding sections of that discussion was that Borowitz is looking for a Judaism that still makes demands. Um, and he means demands here in a serious, not simply a uh, weak sense. Uh, if that is his goal, we should at least uh, raise several questions uh, as to whether uh, what he has outlined thus far and what he will continue to develop in the remaining chapters uh, can lead uh, plausibly and easily to that goal. Uh, first we should ask, can Borowitz really ask uh, for a Judaism that makes demands every time he insists on individual autonomy as a fundamental principle with his conception, within his conception of a post-modern uh, Judaism. That is a recurrent theme. Uh, it has not been subject to qualification uh, in any significant sense. Uh, and we shall have to see if it will be in the remaining chapters. But thus far, no. Remember, we have uh, an individual Jewish self, complete with autonomy, with slash uh, the people Israel, the community of Israel, as both recipients of revelation, uh, revelation uh, understood essentially in personalistic terms, in many ways akin to the I thou relation uh, that uh, Buber spells out in his famous work of that title. Uh, a second question that's related to this, it doesn't have quite the prominence in his work that any insistence on autonomy does, but it complements that insistence. And that is his rejection of the notion of obedience as really being appropriate to a postmodern Judaism. You may recall that he takes that up while discussing the uh, theology of Abraham Joshua Heschel. The relevant pages uh, you can find on uh, pages 211 and 212 of the work. I believe I mentioned this earlier on, at least in passing. What he ends with here is the question, if the life of Torah needs sacrifice, how should we or anyone else make a sacrifice for Judaism? Uh, to give uh, this a concrete expression, I want to direct your uh, attention to page 256. Uh, I am on the first full paragraph of the page, uh, approximately, um, uh, well, I'll read the full paragraph, it's relatively short. I am moved by recent history to intensify this discussion. Might martyrdom ever be required of contemporary non-Orthodox Jews? I pray wholeheartedly none of us ever faces such a situation, even in the skewed ways that our world might present it. Here comes the part, however, that brings him to uh, the conclusion, a very important conclusion, that he's going to develop. Nonetheless, I ask, does our present sense of non-Orthodox Jewish duty ever require us under very special circumstances, so already, that is to say, already having taken place uh, in the halakha, to die for our Judaism? If not, that is to say, if there is no non-Orthodox Jewish duty ever required to die for our Judaism, if Judaism is not ever worth dying, for, then it is hardly significant enough to live by. And he's raised the stakes quite obviously, and he goes on and concludes the paragraph thusly. Acknowledging this strong sense of ultimacy and urgency about Jewish duty, I cannot be satisfied with a weak 
Jewish art. This bears out textually what I had mentioned before about a weak Jewish sense of duty and a strong sense. I seek a theology of serious non-Orthodox obligation that re respects the self's autonomy. It is that ending in view of what he wants with a strong sense of obligation, of ought, that creates the tension I'm trying to illustrate for you. Now, let us go uh, a bit further. On page, um, well, let's see. Having, having read that, let me, no, we won't, we won't uh, read another uh, passage for a bit. The problem that we've just identified, the desire for a strong sense of ought and respect for individual autonomy, autonomy of the Jewish self, is a problem that ultimately lies at the core of any form of religious liberalism. So it is not really a surprise that it should come up in his own work, however much he wishes to uh, achieve and advocate a strong sense of ought. Um, by the time we get to chapter 19, the penultimate chapter in the book, uh, the theme of which is knowing what God wants of us, subtitled, uh, no, it's uh, knowing what God wants of us. Uh, he gets into a, a series of possible objections um, to what has been developed so far as the means of revelation with a sense of genuine and strong ought uh, that is put before us uh, in our relationships to God. That is to say, that of uh, our individual Jewish selves and our collective sense of identity as members of the people of Israel. Um, and the objections uh, uh, really can, can uh, be located uh, along uh, an arc that uh, begins with rationalistic objections to his uh, personalistic conception of revelation uh, on the model of I thou, or if you wish, we thou, uh, thou being the great eternal thou that cannot become an it, outlined by Buber. Uh, I'm not going to go through all five. I'll simply point out to you that they begin on pages, page 267, and they basically uh, uh, end although he, he does uh, have additional remarks to, to make, um, they end on uh, page 272. Um, if religious experience gives us truth, then how do we determine that that truth is true? That is the guide question for the entire discussion. If we make a claim that we have had some kind of genuine religious experience, and from that experience, we believe a truth arises, something that cannot fail to be listened to, heeded, regarded as necessary to act on. How is it that we can establish it to ourselves at least, and uh, perhaps to others, in fact ideally to others as well, that uh, what we have determined is true? If we start with some kind of philosophic or rationalistic frame of reference. Some would put this down as a system, but I don't think it necessarily has to be a system. If we start with that philosophic rationalistic frame of reference, it's going to turn out, as he responds to each of the objections, that um, the truth content is either cut off and regarded as inaccessible, or it is uh, misleading and the uh, origin of that content is uh, self-delusion of one corn, kind or another. Um, he goes into some detail. I'll let you look at the objections uh, that are raised and his responses to all of them, uh, particularly the individual ones. But I do want to uh, turn our attention to a passage in which he begins to develop a bit further uh, the consequences of this um, tension, uh, even opposition, between the search, given our general linguistic conventions, 
our ideas of what is rational and believable and uh, the unique and sometimes uh, surprising experiences we may encounter in the I-thou relationship or the we, the people of Israel, thou relationship, uh, which may call upon us to act in ways that are uh, uh, not conventional uh, and may even be novel in certain important respects. Uh, turn, if you will, to page uh, 274. Uh, the paragraph I have in mind, uh, well, I'll, I'll start earlier. Uh, this, uh, is, I'll start at 273, uh, because um, he gives us a kind of interesting summation of his presentation thus far. And I think it is illuminating and in many ways helpful. So I'm on the first full paragraph, approximately eight or nine lines down, on the top uh, half of page 273, uh, knowing what God wants us to do under the post-liberal theology of Jewish duty. Authentic relationship obligates and, is, and does so in a curious dialectic of particular importance for postmoderns seeking to illumine their experience of being commanded by God. In other words, when there's a real relationship, not simply a, uh, a projection, um, there is a back and forth, that's the dialectic, which is curious, it uh, may be um, an unfamiliar and, and novel, uh, but it's of special importance to postmoderns. He goes on. Its oddity begins with its shared authority. Where one of the partners dominant, as in orthodoxy, we would have something like the master-slave relationship, a figure, meaning a metaphor, we shy away from in recent centuries, translating Eved Adonai as God's servant rather than the more literal and uh, widely held view in uh, ancient times and not so ancient times, uh, rather than the more literal, God's slave. <clears throat> so God is all knowing, uh, omnipotent, uh, the absolute person with a capital A and a capital P, then uh, our relationship uh, to God is essentially that of a slave to do whatever we are ordered to do. That's commentary. Of course, our hesitancy <coughs> has good biblical foundation. God being depicted there as attending to human will uh, pardon me. Our hesitancy has good biblical foundation. God being depicted there, uh, in the Bible that is, as attending to human will and not overriding human freedom. So in the Bible, uh, the willfulness of people uh, is very much uh, recognized. Remember with the uh, obligation in Numbers to uh, have the tzitzit as reminders of the commandments lest we go whoring after other gods and go astray and do whatever our will wants us to do. So that's one of the reasons why we are obligated to behave functionally like a slave would. Okay? Uh, but not overriding human freedom altogether, we have decisions we can make. We moderns have amplified that view of human dignity to include critical power to share in the decisions that affect one so, the model of relationship uh, reflects this enfranchisement of the person by indicating that rightful authority arises between the parties involved. In other words, authority is not only something held by one person in the relationship, in this case the master, God, Rebo no Shalom. It is between the parties. It is shared authority. So that means even the commanded have authority to make decisions, just as the commander, par excellence, God, has authority. What they mean to one another, just as uh, just who they discover themselves and this other to be in this relationship, the special depth and quality of what has and now continues to transpire between them, all these 
exercise normative power on them. In other words, many factors influence the relationship in who will listen to what, who will accede to what, who may contribute what. For to be true to one another, they must carry the meaning they have gained from their relationship into deeds. Inaction or unseemly behavior damages, perhaps destroys, what they have meant to one another. What we have seen in this paragraph so far is a movement from a pre-modern conception of the commanded is absolutely obligated to fulfill what God is understood as the authoritative uh, commander par excellence to do, and that is the pre-modern view, to one that gives authority to both the commander and the commanded, um, autonomy even to both as well. God has uh, autonomy and likewise so do human beings. And that is distinctive of the modern period, which basically freed people from serfdom, from all of the medieval models and pre-medieval uh, models of obligations to absolute monarchs, emphasis on the word absolute. So we all have that dignity. The Bible even re respects something like it, even in ancient times, as does rabbinic literature. But even that is contained to a great degree compared to what has developed in modern times. Uh, let us read on now and see how this is developed. Curiously, too, they do not surrender their autonomy in all this, though its connotations have somewhat changed. Each party to the covenant, God on the one hand, human beings, slash the community of Israel on the other, and the human beings are the Jewish selves that he's spoken about consistently now. Um, the connotations of their autonomy have somewhat changed. Now, the self, and he supplies the Greek word autos, uh, like autobiography, the, the biography of oneself. Uh, now the self, paren autos, discovers its duty in the relation with the other, not as in Kant through universal reason. Notice the, the contrast. Kant could lay down a principle like the categorical imperative act on that principle which you can will without contradiction to be a universal law, or the principle to treat others as ends in themselves. Both are formulations of the categorical imperative. That is going in accordance with reason alone. No other considerations, especially not personal considerations, enter into that calculation of how you go about fulfilling the categorical imperative. What makes it categorical, it binds all persons all the time, no individual circumstances, feelings, background, preferences, aspirations, hopes, fears, or anything else counts. It's universally obligatory. Okay, here the law, nomos, arises. That is to say, a law that is between the parties. From what freely passes between two fully dignified selves, whose selves? the self of God and the self of the Jewish self of the individuals commanded. Neither subordinate to the other. That's a rather strong statement on his part. Each making its claim on the other simply by the act of relating. Uh, if, if you think of the I thou relationship as a, a love relationship, then subordination really is uh, if it's either out of the picture altogether, or it's marginal. Um, think of a friendship, think of a marital relationship. And there are other ways of illustrating it as well. So this is what he's trying to get at in this essentially uh, modern and possibly also postmodern conception of personal autonomy involved in a personal covenant, not a categorical rational covenant or contract. Formally, this equal participation in the relationship transcends other status differences between them. In a family, for example, one may love in this personalistic fashion persons to whom one customarily defers, or who, for whatever honest reason, look up to one. I think of parents and children. Um, 
or uh, adult uh, children vis-a-vis -vis, uh, their parents, grandparents, or even great parents. Okay, genuine relationship can occur despite such uh, difference in status, without compromising the worth that inheres in each of them singly. You see how he's developing further and further different ways of illustrating the notion of genuine relationships where we can learn from each other, even be called upon to respond to each other, sometimes with not a word being said, by the way, uh, it was just the experience of seeing the other in, in a situation or feeling the other in a way that is unique to our relationship. Okay, so genuine, genuine relationship can occur despite such difference in status without compromising the worth that inheres in each of them singly. Just as a relationship with someone one highly esteems will have a special normative effect. Wholeheartedly loving God, the one God of the universe, will most powerfully command us, albeit by our personal response, rather than by uh, God's uh, verbalized mandates. In other words, if we work with the analogy of the human relationship within a family or between friends or in other possible types of illustrations, where there is response, there is encounter, there is a sense of what is expected or needed, and we respond to it, the same can apply and should apply uh, in our understanding of the relationship between we as Jewish selves in covenant, together with the entire people Israel, in covenant with God. Okay. I'm on the top now of 274, and we'll bring this part to a conclusion uh, momentarily. <clears throat> what then does God reveal? if not a detailed teaching that legend says has been kept in heaven before creation? Well, it's not going to be what's kept in heaven from before creation in any uh, detail that we're familiar with. God now makes known just what we make known in a relationship. Again, he's pursuing this analogy. Self, or more familiarly, presence. God may be right there, but we remain on Revelation begins in our awareness, but could not transpire if God did not also come forth to meet us. This is in quotes, by the way. Come forth to meet us and enter into personal intimacy with us. Last sentence. In response, we determine what we now must do. Exercising our autonomy, not as isolates, uh, that is his expression for isolated selves, but keeping faith with the God to whom we have been and to whom we yearn to remain close. And I realize this is a long passage, but it is as <clears throat> helpful in illustrating what he is actually trying to convey in order to justify this um, enhanced and strong sense of Jewish duty in terms of a relationship with God modeled on what should be familiar to all of us in any of a variety of forms in relationships we have with members of our own family, dear friends, and others. Okay, uh, Let me stop for a moment, and uh, we will uh, pick up our uh, discussion in a moment. Now, I indicated earlier that there was another objection that he raises, uh, quite apart from the role uh, that is uh, played by philosophy and the exercise of reason in evaluating whatever experiences we have, personal and non-personal, uh, which uh, basically, both Buber in certain ways and Borowitz likewise, is uh, suggesting that we put aside as simply inadequate to being able to access and experience uh, this unique kind of relationship with God uh, that is described here in Renewing the Covenant. That second objection uh, is essentially this. Um, if there is such a thing as unmediated knowing of the kind that he has been talking about in these personal relationships, uh, then how do we uh, know that the relationship is not 
itself a fraud or a delusion or something based on a fraud or a delusion. Uh, he puts it uh, on uh, page 274 fairly directly under the rubric uh, subheading that is, can we be certain now or tomorrow? This is what he said. If we grant the possibility of such unmediated knowing, how can we know the relationship is real and not an illusion? Recent religious history has been replete with frauds, and our own lives have often been beset by self-delusion. If we do not carefully distinguish between spurious and authentic relationships, we become irresponsible uh, about no less a matter than our relationship with God. A related unease arises from asserting religious continuity, but then insisting that uh, relationships' normative power arises only in the present. If this moment alone directs me, and no past experience of relationship can be rationally identified, there is no revelation of the past that we really ought to believe in, on what basis do we equate the God we encounter now with the God we and our people claim previously to have met. Uh, this is the problem about uh, being uh, uh, subject to illusion. Um, I think it corresponds uh, very roughly to the charge that Freud made in his very famous work called The Future of an Ill Illusion, <clears throat> the illusion being religion in general, uh, and especially those uh, traditions that we associate with Western religions, in which there is a revelation uh, given by a supreme being, uh, a divine uh, figure, uh, who is not seen, uh, not heard, at least with one's uh, ears, but nonetheless capable of uh, commanding very, very unusual things. Um, our, uh, our own personal experience with at least the problem uh, probably comes up in a less uh, overwhelming context whenever we have to face dealing with the interpretation of the Akedat Yitzchak in Genesis 22, uh, simply for her sermonic purposes. Uh, but nonetheless, there has been serious thought devoted to that chapter, and to his credit, Dr. Borowitz, while not taking up that particular issue, uh, is raising the objection that needs to be dealt with. So what he says um, is uh, twofold. I'm going to go to the last paragraph on 274, read it and comment with you, and uh, also uh, a bit into 275, where he develops the analogy we've already been working with a bit further, and I think in an interesting and helpful way. I'm focusing on these passages deliberately, even though they are extensive, simply because I think they will help you uh, in understanding his general uh, direction of thinking with illustrations that are credible and, and plausible, at least to uh, a degree, and maybe to a very uh, considerable degree, that you can communicate in both your teaching and your own reflection. So what he points out in that last paragraph on 274 is, Today, granting authority to rationalism, that is to say, any consistent uh, uh, system of, of rational thinking and principles that one can identify and itemize, today granting authority to rationalism means accepting the assumptions of one or another system of thinking, with rationalists divided over what constitutes a proper rationalism, with that decision necessarily pre- and therefore non-rational, a non-rational approach to a given topic cannot be dismissed out of hand as it once was. Uh, here he's actually trying to um, uh, undermine the objection that something might be considered uh, illusory uh, because it is uh, uh, called into question by a rationalistic system, uh, be it a philosophical system, uh, which is very naturalistic in its orientation, that would be one way. Uh, dealing with, let's say, a psychological system. I've already given the example of Freud, who would uh, say that, um, that the uh, conception of God and even the experience of God is dealing with a projection uh, that one unconsciously makes of a parental figure uh, and uh, inflated uh, very vastly by characteristics and, characteristics and qualities that go well beyond our actual experience of a parent. A parent. Uh, but uh, which nonetheless can be taken to be uh, 
the voice of God. All right? So, uh, his point here is that rationalists disagree with each other, and they cannot come together on what is uh, um, persuasively the rationalistic system that we should turn to. That being the case, uh, the claims of someone uh, appealing to uh, the experience of the I vow relation, uh, even one over time, uh, becomes at least uh, more plausible than it used to be when one prevailing view of what rationality required uh, was, uh, was widespread. Um, I should tell you also that this argument is not uh, new with Dr. Borowitz by any means, and he would be, I'm sure, amongst the first to admit this. It goes back uh, at least to the Middle Ages. Uh, uh, Judah Halevi makes essentially the same claim uh, with regard to the degree that the philosophers disagree among themselves uh, in ancient times, uh, no less than in his own time in the Middle Ages. We're speaking about the uh, first half of the 12th century primarily. Um, in that regard, uh, they don't represent, no matter how uh, insightful and how erudite and how sophisticated, they don't represent a credible uh, and conclusive claim uh, against uh, the teachings of a revealed religion, even regarding the revelation itself. You can find that in part one of the Kuzari. Uh, rather early on, uh, I think it's uh, relatively soon after part one, section 11. Uh, that said, let's see what he does with this as he goes on. Thus I have been arguing for, last line of page 274, uh, its employment in religious Thought, that is to say, the hermeneutic power of non-rational approaches, personalistic ones are specifically what he has in mind, as opposed to conceptual ones based on argument and evidence and logic. Thus I have been arguing for its employment, uh, personalistic systems, in religious thought, because its power to uncover and illumine is less reductionist and more fully disclosive disclosive uh, uh, of important things than the alternatives. It will not yield the kind of certainty that rationalisms produce in areas of their adequacy. That means in areas that they naturally are paired up with. Uh, for example, the call for evidence, very rigorous kinds of evidence that you'd find in the empirical sciences, or the call for clarity in formulation and argument that you might find uh, in fields that depend on logic or mathematical proof or essentially uh, conceptual inferences based on inclusion, exclusion, and the like. So, um, it will not yield the kind of certainty that rationalisms uh, produce in the areas of their adequacy, but I, like many other caring Jews, do not find this cause to panic, that is the fact that uh, um, the models he's proposing uh, uh, don't trump in a decisive way uh, rationalistic systems. And he doesn't find it a reason to fly to an orthodoxy or a rationalistic philosophy. Uh, rather, the kinds of uncertainty it uh, produces, uh, that is to say, uh, uh, let's say personalistic uh, uh, conceptions, of religious experience, of the kind that we associate with I thou and his uh, specific interpretations of it with the Jewish self, the kinds of uncertainty it produces seem characteristic of the most humane forms of contemporary thought. Thus I agree with those who associate maturity not with a consistent set of certainties about the world or about history, but with an informed openness that allows for growth and change while demonstrating sufficient integrity to avoid the irresponsibility of relativism. So, um, you don't have to have certainty uh, on your side in order to make your case. You can have uh, a, a view based on experience, one that you have reflected on and can uh, interpret, but your mind is open to factor in other things that bear upon it, might help illuminate it, might call into question misunderstandings of it and the like. This, he thinks, is a sign of maturity and actually a humane uh, element in contemporary life, which is for him now postmodern life.
Um, he goes on, and I'm on the bottom uh, of 275, about um, five lines from the bottom of the middle paragraph. More commonly, even our moments of great significance give way to doubts. So he's prepared to grant we even have doubts about things that may move us greatly at a particular time in our life. If we are to love, we must live with this fearsome alternation of knowing slash not knowing. Personhood does not allow more certainty than this, and even the records of saints show this to be the common pattern of relationship with God. So if we dispense with the requirement that we must be absolutely certain, which many rationalists will demand as a requirement of believing anything that is uh, to be regarded as a religious claim, if we dispense with that absolute claim for certainty, then we can realistically evaluate our views over different periods of time, sometimes perhaps challenging something we were close to certain about before, uh, being open again for uh, further illumination later that will reassure us, because this comes with relationships. We find the same things in our relationships as I say, with family members, or the spouse that we choose and live with over a long, long number of years. Um, there are moments of communication, there are moments of the lack of communication, not to mention understanding, and yet they can come alive again. So he adds, we also easily speak of relationships extending through time, despite the harsh reality that the immediacy of encounter begets only a temporary certainty. It sometimes manifests such quality that we hope it will recur. In other words, we again experience things that are so uh, exciting, encouraging, uh, meaningful, that we look for them to recur as often as possible. Allowing acquaintance to ripen into friendship, perhaps even love, or almost miraculously, the love that elicits the pledge of self for the life we call marriage. We cannot be certain this will ever happen, but we also know it sometimes does because we have had certain true relationships in our lives. So enduring relationships begin in the hope that the confirming meeting will recur and restore our assurance. Our relationship with God, this is the first full paragraph on 276, and uh, I'll close with this. Our relationship with God follows this pattern closely. We know God's reality not by reasoning about God, but by that kind of human reach that opens us to God's presence. It, too, finds its staying power as it returns to overcome the skepticism that besets us in the face of the trials life thrusts upon us. Why should responsible people risk their lives on so subjective a judgment? Because to begin with, this side of orthodoxy, that is to say on the non-orthodox side of orthodoxy, we make no serious choice that is untouched by significant hazard. The record of many rationalisms that in recent decades have behaved, betrayed their adherents' utter confidence confirms our wariness of intellectual rigidity. In other words, the challenges that especially in post-modernity that have been directed against all kinds of foundationalist theories of knowledge, uh, where you have you know, a, an approach to things that is designed to yield whatever clarity and certainty is possible. But all of them have been challenged in one way or another. It's constructions of the human mind, and therefore not absolutely certain, certainly not as replicas of how reality is external to us. So um, he wants to dispense with the intellectual rigidity that will require us to achieve this in religion, much less to rely upon it uh, in philosophy. Our choice cannot realistically be limited to risk-free alternatives. The best we can do is to ensure that the risks we undertake, here accepting ex the experience of God as self-validating, have safeguards that reasonably compensate for our mistakes, and we make them, and misapprehension, misapprehensions. For Jews, this means that the burden of this discussion shades over into the consequences of relational revelation for our lives. 
a theme I will begin to discuss in this chapter and continue in the next. Okay, this is a, um, a very helpful and important um, elaboration of the analogy between uh, the I-Thou relationship in human relationships and the analogy with the divine human I, eternal thou relationship, and we, community of Israel relationship with God, as Borowitz understands it. So what comes out of it? Reason enters after the experience, not beforehand in the rationalistic system that it has to match up with certainty for certainty. It asks questions. It calls us to reflect upon what we have experienced. Uh, how we have interpreted what we take to be obligatory, and being open to further experience, both reflective in terms of our own initiative and personalistic, but coming from the divine presence in God, obviously, and even in human beings created in God's image. All right. Um, What is his uh, view of halakha, uh, particularly as the result of um, the divine human encounter? It is going to be uh, not an inflexible or rigid halakha. He takes to task and actually dissociates himself from the halakha that is traditionally associated with orthodoxy and, ultimate, uh, and ultra-orthodoxy. And likewise, I might add, from the halakha as it is understood within conservative Judaism. On page 282, uh, he makes it clear that uh, this is at most guidance. It is not a, a statement of absolute obligation uh, that can be accepted uh, out of either a sense of Jewish duty or a sense of the obviousness uh, that this is the infallible divine command. <coughs> what I have in mind on page 282, regarding the flexible halakha, um, is uh, the following. Uh, I'm in the first paragraph, and I'm going to go a little bit into the second. It is disingenuous to suggest that we are only doing the same thing today. Um, that is to say, uh, uh, engaging in self-legislation, um, uh, but unconsciously so that it's autonomy in a different form. Uh, what he goes on to add is this. The sages never cite progress in ethical thought or historical spiritual growth, growth pardon me, historical spiritual growth as a reason for halachic change. And we come to every question with a self-conscious openness to the possibility of innovation they would have deemed heretical. So his view of halakha will allow for innovation, even self-conscious innovation, um, uh, on behalf of what he calls uh, a flexible halakha, as opposed to accepting uh, the uh, notion of new changes as uh, uh, evidence of progress that we can uh, read into the halakha. It is simply not part of it. Hence, a theology of flexible halakha would have to validate our authority to make changes in ways that the overwhelming majority of those who today discipline their lives by its precepts would consider a break with the past. So however much we would like to identify progressive lines of, of uh, halakhic judgment, this is not what uh, Borowitz sees as plausible for anyone who aligns himself with halacha as it has traditionally been understood. As a result of this theological impasse, he says, protagonists of the necessity of structuring non-Orthodox Judaism on a flexible uh, halacha have sought to save their case by asserting either of two positions. In other words, those who wish to assert a flexible halacha, uh, but nonetheless be loyal to the notion of um, uh, have a way of presenting their case. He cites uh, two conservative Jews of uh, uh, considerable importance, uh, Rabbi David Novak and the other, of, uh, of course, is uh, Rabbi Elliot Dorf. David Novak asserts that
that it is a dogma of Jewish faith that the halakha is capable of flexible application and development. And the second is uh, Rabbi Elliot Dorf and also Neil Gilman of JTS, uh, who humanistically argue that the Jewish ethos requires us to live by halakha. In other words, this is just part of what it is to be a Jew, part of the culture that we inherit from the past. And that's why it is binding upon us if we are going to identify ourselves as Jews at all, and even perhaps more powerfully so as Jewish selves. The caring, non-Orthodox Jewish community has indicated its rejection of both arguments by a non-halachism it defends as a matter of conscience. Conscience. As long as Jews continue to believe that a God-given dignity inheres in each single self, a halakha that can require the significant surrender of conscience will be unacceptable. And so, we have to say we are really operating outside traditional halakha. We take what it has to say seriously, but we are prepared to treat it flexibly and to treat it innovatively, but we know we do this by standing outside of halakha as a system. Okay, That is what he is getting at. Uh, it is for guidance only, and with this I am going to conclude. Uh, this is the bottom of page 282. With so many Jews only willing to accept halakha as guidance, I am convinced that we have come to an end of the period when Jewish living could still be disciplined by rabbinic halakha. By contrast, I believe that the relational theory of revelation, I thou relationship, I uh, uh, we eternal thou relationship, uh, I believe the relational theory of revelation generates the possibility of creating its own pattern for giving form to Jewish life its own, quotes, halachic, end quote, structure. And I shall discuss it in the next chapter. Um, what he is speaking for is a kind of progressive revelation. And uh, I'm just going to uh, conclude the entire discussion uh, by um, uh, noting the following. Halacha is only a source of guidance. Uh, our communal lifestyle can be shaped by it, but not decisively governed by it. He argues for a non-orthodoxy in which the individual self is autonomous and the community is likewise autonomous, but, and this is an important but, shaped by the covenant, understood in terms of the covenant relationship, which is ongoing unfolding and thereby progressive. The autonomous Jewish self makes the determinations here. One's obligations to the covenant may lead one to reject the halacha, at least in given cases, um, and there are several that he names. I'll, I will mention them. You can find these on page uh, two, let's see, uh, 297. Uh, and let me at least read what he adds here this will uh, round out our discussion. As I understand the range of my obligations under the covenant, I do not believe God wants some Jews to relate to others by categorizing them and treating them as agunot, deserted wives, and mamzerim, bastards. Thus, I will abet Jews seeking to fulfill their covenantal responsibilities outside these laws. As a pluralist, I oppose any suggestion by the non-Orthodox that Orthodox Jews should be asked to compromise their understanding of God's law for the sake of communal unity. I do, however, find it troubling that while the halakha has kept some laws such as an eye for an eye in force, but practically inoperable, contemporary poskim have not yet demonstrated such creativity in this area. The issue of women's rights and traditional Jewish marriage and divorce law disturbs Jews like me far more uh, because committed fundamentally to the concept of personhood, I consider women's equality a critical matter of contemporary Judaism. 
So he sets out um, here and elsewhere uh, a variety of subjects uh, with which the book ends uh, in terms of what he is prepared to accept and what he is not prepared to accept. It turns out that ethics will clearly trump cases like this, and it, are, it is basically ethical considerations. Uh, but uh, he also uh, accepts the obligation to uh, have people produce Jewish children. Um, and he literally suggests that the ethical takes precedence unless the survival of the Jewish people is at stake. Uh, and for situations in which it is at stake, uh, the duty to have children takes precedence over uh, the uh, ethical uh, intermarriage. Uh, and he gives the issue of intermarriage uh, some consideration before the chapter, the final chapter, is completed. So, um, this is our uh, survey. You will want to uh, examine what he has to say with some care. Um, he is trying to use uh, liberalism as a guidepost uh, in his conception and rethinking of uh, postmodern Judaism. He is trying to uh, give some emphasis to reason uh, without making it uh, systematic and uh, um, inclined to search for certainties. He wishes to preserve autonomy in what uh, he calls the autonomous Jewish self that participates in the covenant by a self-determining choice. Um, and he accords authority, uh, as well as autonomy, both to individual Jews, to the people of Israel, taken as a collective, and to God. Um, I think that uh, is enough to summarize it. I hope at least the majority of what has been said and reviewed here is tolerably clear. And um, we can consider this segment of the material on renewing the covenant. Thank you for your interest and for your attention.